funding for Leah Chase, the Queen of Creole Cuisine, is made possible by the Whitney Institute, the Rhodes Family Businesses, the Dillard University Ray Charles Program in African American Material Culture, the Nellie Murray Feast Committee, Liberty Bank, McElhaney Company, Entergy Corporation, Richard and Linda Friedman, Harris New Orleans City Council Community Support Grant, Talbot Realty Group, New Orleans Auction, Susan and Fayez Serafim, Patrick F. Taylor Foundation, International House, Metro Service Group, Richard's Disposal, Friends of Leah Chase, Chef Susan Spicer, and Ed Marshall. In a city where good food and great hospitality aren't hard to find, there are those places that manage to stand out in the crowd of excellence. Dookie Chases is one of those places, mostly because of the feisty chef who's been making it all happen here for the last 70 years, Leah Chase. You will still find her in the kitchen, cooking gumbo, making roux, telling everybody what to do. The gift of Leah Chase to the, to the world is every person who thinks black, white, Asian, it doesn't matter. When you think you cannot do it, all you have to do is look at her life story and say, you know what? If she can do it, I can do it. And she's happy to tell you that. That's Leah Chase to me. Leah's gift to all of us is the art hanging in Dookie Chase restaurant. Art by African-American artists of international, national, and local fame. People go there for Leah's food. I mean, it's great, and that's why they go there. I mean, if you go there and ask for a stuffed eggplant, my God, it would be fantastic. And everybody knows what about stuffed eggplant. You look at the menu, you don't know what you can order. No city in America has anybody comparable to Leah Chase. She is uniquely New Orleans. She is uniquely, she belongs to us and to the traditions and the spirit of the place. She epitomizes the depths and the meaning and the importance of this city. I'm Michelle Miller outside of Dookie Chase Restaurant, where the queen of Creole cuisine creates dishes for her customers that give them just a little bit of her soul. Her story really starts north of New Orleans, across Lake Pontchartrain, in the small town of Madisonville, Louisiana. Born on January 6, 1923, the first official day of the year's Mardi Gras season. I came from a family that was really family-oriented, and we had a lot of children. My mother had raised 11 of us. Nine girls, two boys, and somehow they all fit in this shotgun house in the country. One of her sisters, Sylvia, still lives there. Her parents, Charles and Hortensia Lang, were strong Catholics. They believed in God and hard work. They grew vegetables and fruit trees, raised pigs, chickens, and turkeys, and had a 20-acre strawberry field to help with the family income. So you had to walk three miles or four miles to pick those strawberries. And after you bend your back picking them all day, you had to walk back. And when you walk back, maybe you had a tub of clothes there waiting for you to wash. Her father worked in the shipyards nearby and in the fields. His WPA job paid 50 cents a day. So everyone had to pitch in if they were all going to eat. I remember one time mother had couple of turkeys, you remember that? Lord, yes, do I remember oh, that Oh, she turkey? was proud of her turkeys. And another thing, she was proud of her guinea hens. 
Oh, that was the worst thing to ever put in the yard. They were noisy, 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 but they were good to eat. They'd catch quail in the strawberry fields. Her mom would turn that into a sweet and savory meal of quail, grits, and plum sauce, a dinner Leah would one day serve to a president of the United States. I think part of what the world is missing today is the dinner table in a big, big way. Meager food turned into masterpieces as far as we were concerned in our cast iron pot. It was at that table that we said grace, as Leah's table said grace. It was at that table that no matter how humble the food, it was served on the best platter you had. They taught us that we sit down with the tablecloth. I remember the tablecloth. Oh, during the week, we had oil cloth. But on Sunday, you had a starched and iron tablecloth. Of course, it might have been made out of flour sacks that you washed and bleached and starched and embroidered, but you had a nice tablecloth. On Sundays after church, they'd stay in town to watch the boats come in. Fishing boats are better yet, ferries full of people, some of them visitors from New Orleans. It was whites only on the top decks, everyone else had to stay below. No one in her family ever said anything. That's just the way it was. Her father especially never spoke out. He was never gonna rock the boat, never, not him. I'll never forget, <laughs> he punished me one time because Miss Chatelier, you had to register your newborn babies with her. So, and I know I'm gonna be so modern and so big, I'm gonna fill out the papers. So I said, and I'm not gonna be colored. I'm not gonna be colored. Negro, I'm gonna put it on oh, my daddy said, no, my daddy gave me a good weapon. Take that off of there and put colored on there. See, he was so passive, he wasn't going to aggravate anybody, not him. When Leah was ready for high school at the age of 13, there were no high schools nearby for African-American children. So her parents put her on the lower deck of the ferry to New Orleans to live with an aunt. She would go to St. Mary's Academy in the French Quarter, a Catholic school run by an order of black nuns. Her parents scraped to come up with her tuition of $10 a month. It was bad in those days to be poor. It was, to me, worse than segregation because it wasn't like the poor today. They give people things and they try to up it. Back in those days, you were poor and that's it. You were not even noticed. She graduated in three years and came home to work at a local boarding school. When she was 18, her father let her return to New Orleans where she was expected to go to work in a sewing factory just like her mom and her aunts and some of her sisters. Instead of work the sewing factories, I went to work in the French Quarter as a waitress. Now that was a big no-no. But I could not see myself sitting down, shooting out pants pockets all day long, or, or sewing flaps or doing whatever, because that's what factories are, piece work. You make pants pockets, you set pants pockets, you make lapels, you set lapels or whatever. And I didn't do that. So my mind was always somewhere else. So she found a job at the Colonial Restaurant on Charters in the French Quarter. It was her first time inside a restaurant. I would work and ask the chef all kinds of things and they would get angry with me because chefs get angry at you when you're buttoning their business, but anyway, that's what I did. And I worked there until the woman opened the coffee pot. Then I helped her open the coffee pot. And our first dish in New Orleans in a commercial restaurant was Wiener Jambalaya. And she was so excited because her pot of Wiener Jambalaya sold out in about five minutes. And the woman who owned the restaurant said, you do that again tomorrow. She learned, she practiced, and even picked up a few other jobs to earn money. She marked the racehorse board for a local bookie and even managed two amateur boxers at the Coliseum Arena in town. But it was the restaurant business that called her. 
I worked the quarters, and I'll never forget. I used to pass by a restaurant all the time. I loved the chairs. It didn't bother me that I couldn't go in that restaurant. It's just those chairs that fascinated me. I always wanted this restaurant so bad. After I worked in the French quarters, I said, I want this, I would like one like this. If, if I ever get somewhere, I'd like a restaurant. Edgar Dookie Chase Jr. was playing in a band, his own band. The young man had been on the road since he was 16 playing trumpet and leading the band. Playing a gig in New Orleans one night in 1946, he saw Leah in the audience. My band was playing for a carnival ball at the Labor Union Hall here in New Orleans. And I saw a pretty lady in the audience. And I told one of my men in the band to come take over the band for me. I was going to dance with that pretty person I saw over there. You know? <laughs> Well, I was good looking, had a nice shape, blah, 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 blah. So he wanted to meet me, so I got to meet him, and that was too funny. Another thing, my uncle used to say musicians were lazy people, musicians were this, musicians. Musicians were not looked on as great people. I rather sports people, and I love people with physical and emotional strength. They always fascinated me. While not her type, they hit it off right away. By the time I met him, I was, what, 22 years old. And would you believe he was only 18? So, and it just went from there. You know, we went everywhere together. It was a fast romance. Within three months, they were married. And within a few years, they had a growing family. They would have four children, three girls and one boy. It just so happened that Dookie's parents owned a little tavern, a bar really, in the other half of their shotgun double in the historic Treme neighborhood of New Orleans. They served drinks and an occasional sandwich. His mom, Emily, mostly ran the place. Edgar Dookie Sr. liked that it was successful. He dressed up in his diamond ring, in his diamond stick pin, in his diamond watch, and he just looked good. <laughs> and she liked to look at him look good, so, so that worked well. Soon as the children grew a bit older, Leah volunteered to help out at the restaurant, and she had some ideas of her own to change the place, starting with the menu. So I said, no, we gotta change this. For one thing, we're gonna change this menu. So I'm gonna put lobster thermidor on the menu. Oh, these black folks don't know nothing about lobster thermidor. We're going to put shrimp cocktail on. Nobody knew what a shrimp cocktail was. They thought it was something to drink. Black folks didn't, we didn't go in restaurants. There's only people like us who worked in there who knew what went on. We couldn't go in there to see what went on. So everybody said, oh, she's going to ruin your business. She's just going to run you out of business, this, that, and the other. So I had to back up. Now let me do what I know how to do. Let me do what I see them do at home. So then I start with stuffed chicken breast. Black folks did that. They stuffed chicken with oyster dressing. They made griots. They made veal pane. So I start putting that on and it worked. So it became her version of Creole cooking, a mix of Spanish, French, and African. She also wanted to make it a really nice restaurant with tablecloths and chairs she'd seen and loved from the restaurants in the quarter. But my mother-in-law was, the thing that got her most is not so much the change into the menu, is the decor. She couldn't see eye to eye with me on the decor. She liked pink and blue. I hate pink and blue. I thought pink and blue looked like a baby cradle or something but she liked pink and blue. So I said, uh-uh, we changing this dining room. We put red in here, so I put red on the wall. Walls became red and gold, brighter colors for an expanded space. The entire double was now a restaurant, and she finally got those chairs, just like the ones in the French Quarter restaurants. 
So that's the first thing I wanted to find me a chair like that. So it took some doing with my mother-in-law because she wanted her steel leg chairs with the plastic covers. No, I want this chair. So, and I've had these chairs since 1957 and I'm, I'm pretty proud of them. She was molding her dream and she wanted to share it. So when I look at Leah's gift to the world, it's that message that no matter where you come from, no matter what the poverty you experience in your life, the social aspect that was never shown to you, the ability to even walk in a restaurant was not for you. But yet, to push all of that out of the way, all of that fog, to clear the room and say, you know what, here I am, and it's all up to me. Nobody's going to give me anything. Dookie Chase's was becoming the place to go, the only place at first. She had taken a tavern and turned it into a tablecloth dining experience. Blacks had nowhere else to go, you know, to any restaurant of any real quality and really outstanding aesthetic than, than at Dookie's. Leah poured everything she had into the restaurant. Her husband Dookie took care of the money. She took care of everything else. She was a natural. Dookie was always behind the bar at the cash register, but she was all over the place because when you went there, she just didn't cook. She cooked, but then she came out and was, you know, if you wanted her to be a part of it, she would, and if you invited her to talk, she would, but she wanted you to know that you were welcome there. And of course, it was the only place the black celebrities could eat. I don't know whether you were talking about King Cole or whether you were talking about uh, Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, anybody who was anything in the music world came to Dookie's when they came to New Orleans. Many of those famous faces grace the walls and her memory. Anything you cook, it brings back memories. Everybody who came through my restaurant, Lena Horn, who liked her fried chicken, Sarah Vaughan, who liked her stuffed crabs, then Quincy Jones and all those people who loved gumbo. Michael Jackson with his sweet potato pies. You think about them every time you cook. I never lost my heart while stealing a glance, taking a chance, trying romance. But when your eyes hang out that danger sign, ooh, kick Rudy. The funniest thing was when Nat Cole came, he asked for his eggs. So Dookie called me all excited. I was still at home. He said, uh, Nat Cole is here and he wants fermented eggs. Fermented eggs, do you know what that is? I said, no, but I'm coming down there now. And you, you had to know how Nat spoke kind of through his nose like, and he wanted a four minute egg. So I had to give him his four minute eggs. Ooh, kick mm, that's all. Celebrities loved her. But it's the not-so-famous people who really helped make this what it is. It's those who spent time here, made memories here. Some of the brothers who had you know, more than one girlfriend couldn't go anywhere else, so they tried. <laughs> so, you know, the worst place you could go and try to you know, hide from your number one lady would be Dookie Chase, right? And so I, there were incidents like that. What were you thinking, you know? Whether it was just a night out or a prom date, anniversary, whatever special or regular dinner out, the reputation of Dookie Chases was spreading beyond its walls, beyond the neighborhood, beyond the city. Ray Charles made, it had these famous lyrics about, you know, going to Dookie Chase, trying to get something to eat. The waitress looked at me and said, Ray, you sure look beat. So that was a, a blues song called Early in the Morning, which was very, very popular, not only in New Orleans, but all over the country. So the mention that he made of Dookie's, you know, just made people aware of it everywhere.
While food certainly played its part in her story, there were other roles Leah and Dookie Chase played in history. You know, in this restaurant, in some ways, we really changed the course of America when you think about it because we had all the civil rights people planning things here and then they would go out and come back. And I say we changed the course of America over a bowl of gumbo. Early on, eating a bowl of Leah's gumbo, or anything she cooked, was only available to those of her own race. The Louisiana legislature had made it against the law for whites and blacks to eat or drink or gather in the same building. No mixing of color or culture. Voices calling for civil rights were getting louder. Sit-ins and school desegregation issues played out on streets and on the TV. There were shouts, there were whispers, and on this corner in Treme at Dookie Chase's restaurant, there were civil conversations over dinner. When the civil rights movement came along, the Chase family, and Leah especially, had the courage to allow us to have meetings between blacks and whites during the 60s, during the era. So blacks and whites could meet there and eat there, which was illegal. The Freedom Riders who rode interstate buses into and through the South challenging segregation would find their way to Dookie Chases. Civil activists, black and white, would gather here in secret and safety. Actually, Leah and Dookie didn't set out to be freedom fighters. They were hoping for easy, peaceful change. They didn't want to lose what they built here. But they weren't about to turn away those who were pushing forward, pushing boundaries. She was ground zero. You know, people could go there all hours of the night. And there used to be a long, narrow room, sort of upstairs. And uh, that's where a lot of those civil rights uh, meetings were held because it, it didn't interfere with the business downstairs. And they, and they were talking high level strategy, you know, and felt very welcome. History was made at Dookie Chase in that upper room. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, Constance Baker Motley, A.P. Turo, my husband, uh, Jack Greenberg, and a number of other legal giants strategized right there at Dookie Chase. I think she provided an environment of security. And I remember asking her once, well, if I bring some of these uh, uh, white kids in here and so forth and so on, what if the police come? She said, the police will not come in here. <laughs> They're not coming in my restaurant. You know? And you don't have to worry about that. And they never flinched, you know. The cops would never come in there. They'd be outside, but they never bothered us, blacks or whites. You had policemen that was over this, this district, and they got to know you, so they protected you. They would come in, and my mother-in-law would fix them a sandwich, treat them to a sandwich. Now you can't do that. That's illegal. They think you're bribed. But she didn't do that as a bribe. She was just grateful for their help wherever she could get it, whatever they did, you know, or the protection that the neighborhood had. We felt free that in this little zone of, of uh, freedom, we could plan and do everything without fear of getting arrested at Dookie's. That don't mean when we left, you know, that day we, we're back to normal racist America. Uh, but while we were in there, nobody felt any intimidation whatsoever. Just one time they had a pipe bomb, somebody passed in the car and threw a pipe bomb. And that went through the door, through the bar, but nobody was hurt by that. So, yeah, patch the wall up and keep going. What the heck, you just do that. They all just kept on going. Those strategy meetings held here, while against the law, did help change the laws. Being able to work together, even in secret, made a difference. And while segregation and racism were real and rampant, New Orleans did not have the level of bloodshed and destruction seen in other Southern cities. But the reason it went easier in New Orleans, because in New Orleans, different than other cities, we lived together. You know, just look at this area. We had Miss Conforto live over her grocery there. She was Italian. We had white people living in the next block. 
We had black people living here, white people living there. So you see, we, we knew one another. We lived together, so we knew one another. We didn't go into your house. We didn't socialize with you, but you knew me and I knew you. So that made it a little bit easier than it did in, in Mississippi. While the struggle for equal rights was still painfully slow, a lot more people now knew about Dookie Chases, the place and the taste. I remember some very dear friends of mine during the uh, civil rights problems. Uh, and everybody, they were using Leah's place to meet. And some of my friends said to me, you know, this has got to be some of the best food I ever put in my mouth. Many went back, and Leah's reputation for both cooking and caring grew. Even white people revered her so much. You know, they, they saw her humanity and her, you know, she didn't care about racial differences and so on, and she behaved the same way toward everybody. And I think anybody who ever encountered her had to be impressed. Leah Chase began to get involved in more and more causes and campaigns. She helped Ebony Magazine put on its first fashion fair. The hugely popular event would eventually go nationwide, but its debut raised money for the Flint Goodrich Hospital, at the time the only private hospital in New Orleans that granted staff privileges to African-American surgeons. Leah was one of the first to financially support her friend Ernest Dutch Morial in his successful 1977 political campaign. He became the first African-American mayor of New Orleans. Leah and Dookie would later join him in another campaign, one that would bring the world to Louisiana. My husband was mayor when there was an effort to get the World's Fair to come in. And he took a, a cadre of people from uh, all professions to France. He took Leah and Dookie Chase with him, and they made a grand presentation. So they were an important cog in that wheel to bring the World's Fair here to New Orleans. Her generosity didn't stop at fairs and fashion shows. She always seemed ready to step up, to help out wherever she was needed. This city was at one time predominantly Catholic. We didn't work on November 1st because that was All Saints Day. We went to the cemetery on that day and nobody worked, no schools open, no nothing. And you spent the day in the cemetery. You wore your good dress in the cemetery, you had food, you put flowers on the tombs. Just like the savory aromas coming from her kitchen and the sounds of her family voices, faith has always been a familiar part of Leah's life. You know, all of these children, you see, we have, my mother had 11 of us. We all pray every day. We all go to church. And because that's the way we came up. I told you, my daddy told us, all you need to do in life is three things. You need to pray, you need to work, and do for others in that order. There was no mystery to it. You follow the Ten Commandments, as simple as that. You share the little bit you have with whoever needs it. You don't complain about what you don't have. And then you grow up, you never forget your family, and you go out and you represent your family to the world in the best way you can. How many are the studio has in there? Food seemed to be Leah's best way. For her, it's always been entwined with family and faith. And one priest comes through here, he said, Leah, do you know, that's where the poor boy come from, Jesus and the fish and the loaves. <laughs> so I said, okay, Father, I'll take that too. But, you know, it tells you that that's how you get with people. You feed them, you make them happy. You can talk over a lot of things over some food. One of her most talked about specials only appears one day a year on Holy Thursday, the day before Good Friday. Actually, the only entrees on the menu that day, 
fried chicken, and a special gumbo made with an odd number of greens. She uses nine. It's a long-standing Lent tradition that goes way back. Leah believes you make a new friend for every green in the pot. They made this gumbo zab that has, we have veal stew in it, two kinds of sausage, chicken, ham, everything. And on Holy Thursday, you didn't get really anything to eat until Lent was over, and that was at noon on Saturday back in those days. Over the years, her faith has led her to do good works with her food and her money. But to her, it's more than a responsibility. It's a way of life. Your job <clears throat> is what feeds your face and buys your clothes, but your work, your work on earth is to do God's will, is to help somebody else up, is to better the world you live in. Her success allowed her to help different causes and issues, support fundraisers, she still cooks and gives away food for special events, using her name and her talents to lend a hand. Oh, what the heck, you know? You give away some, it'll come back. And I never planned on getting rich. I, I, I never planned on having a lot of things for myself. So it didn't bother me, you know, that I felt good if I was given something. Those who know her or know of her see that side of Leah Chase, the matter-of-fact, determined woman who often finds ways to help without all of the fanfare. The Bible says you will know a tree by its fruit. And, you know, the, the, the fruit of Leah Chase is love, compassion, mercy. Now, she's tough. She believes in personal responsibility. She believes in hard work. She wants you to get up early, right? She wants you to stay late, but she also believes in the communion of human beings. When tragedy struck in 1990, it was faith and work that kept Leah Chase going. The sudden death of her oldest daughter, Emily, who had worked side by side with her in the kitchen, broke her heart. I remember when my daughter died. I remember that was the hardest thing in the world. She went home, she worked here, and she went home at five o'clock, and I knew she was in trouble. She was pregnant, couldn't deliver that baby. Something was wrong, I don't know what. One o'clock that morning, she was dead, just died. You know, that was a hard blow. But I had to get up that next morning and open this restaurant. You could cry, you could stay home, you could nothing is going to bring that person back. But what people don't understand is when you're tough or they think you're tough like that, they look at you as if you don't have any feelings at all. They don't understand the tough and the strong have the same feelings as the weak. You have the same hurt, you just don't show it. Her strength and determination often show up with a smile. It's how she greets her guests, her friends, even strangers. If I could just make a difference, that would be the only thing. If you live a life and you look back and you say, well, I did make a difference. You know, I did something that bettered the world or uplifted somebody. And that's all you do. She has a lot of words of wisdom and she isn't shy about sharing. Some she's learned along the way, some she's carried all her life. She said, you know, Rudy, my mother told me, if you wanted to succeed in a man's world, she says, you gotta think like a man, dress like a girl, act like a woman, and work like a slave. <laughs> so I mean, I'm paraphrasing, because I don't remember it for that. It was something like that. And to that recipe, Leah Chase added passion for faith, for family, and for food. And somewhere along the way, a friend introduced her to the art world. In the mid-70s, Leah Chase started to see things in a different way, through the eyes of artists. Urged by her good friend, Celestine Cook, Miss Chase took a board position here at the New Orleans Museum of Art. This began an awakening in her midlife. 
I had a good friend that was in, she was on the museum board. She was the only African-American on that board. So when she got off the board, she said, I'm gonna put your name up. I said, don't do that because I do not know anything about it. She said, but you will learn. With a lot of help and advice, Leah took her own small step into the art world. She bought a poster. It was from a collection done by the famous African-American artist, Jacob Lawrence. From then on, she was educating herself in African-American artwork that she could collect. So I think she started collecting Elizabeth Catlett's work. She also bought uh, something from one of the local star artists at the time, Richard Thomas, that hangs in the restaurant. I think from then on, like most art collectors who start collecting, that bug started to gnaw at her. And then one turned into two, and this turned into 30 uh, works or so of art that, you know, hang within the uh, confines of the restaurant. The gift she has given to all of us is a, an art gallery, a museum, someone who would never put foot in a museum can come into Dookie Chase, order a po' boy, and be in the midst of all of this wonderful art by African-American artists. That's a gift that nobody else has replicated. At the time, they didn't have, nobody showed African-American artwork in galleries. They didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So if I put it on my wall, people will see it. And well, first people thought I was crazy. They said, this is a restaurant, <laughs> it's not a museum, it's blah, 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 blah. I said, but it's mine. So I just went out there and put it up. Among her favorites, the stained glass serves as a divider between a serving hallway and the dining room. And I told him I wanted to put stained glass there. So my husband, oh, I like stained glass, but Dookie thought I was gonna put church windows. Instead, she commissioned the panels to capture her own memories. This was a double. One side was this, so my neighbor could be in her blinds and I could be in mine, we could talk, but nobody would see us. So I remember they used to play that game, Rock Teacher. You would sit on the bottom step and then you'd have your hands crossed. The rock would be, so to guess what hand the rock was in, and if you guessed it, you went up a step. But I like what he did there because, you know, there are mixtures of color in our community. So look, you have different color hands. She felt it only right to help the artists who were giving so much to the world through their painting by buying their work, encouraging their success, even cooking up some supplies. And I'm, I'm proud of my ham shakes because I have a friend that's an artist and he's doing a piece of art with bones. So I save him all the bones. So my bones will be saved. <laughs> they will go into a work of art. So, you know, artists are weird. Good people, but weird. A quality that over the years she's enjoyed and appreciated and championed. In 1995, Leah was called to testify before the U.S. House Appropriations Subcommittee, where she defended funding for the National Endowment for the Arts. Artist Gustav Blanche began a project in 2009 that would capture Leah Chase in her favorite place, the kitchen. 20 paintings, one of them now hangs in the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. It's titled, Cutting Squash. It's almost as though she's a senator and we're senator to Washington in some form or fashion, but to have her represent us in the National Portrait Gallery where presidents' portraits are, she's our representative and I, I can't think of a greater honor to at least play somewhat of a role uh, in this, you know, great achievement. Many other honors and awards have Leah's name engraved on them in recognition of her culinary skills and also for her contribution to culture and community. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, isn't this wonderful? If you name an award in American food, there's thousands of them. But I can guarantee you between the biggest ones that everybody recognizes, all the Hall of Fame awards, National Restaurant Hall of Fame, uh, the uh, uh, Culinary Review, 
the James Beard Foundation, uh, the Southern Food and Beverage. I mean, you name it. Uh, for me to start naming Leah Chase's awards, it would take me for an hour and a half because she's got them all, and deservingly so. Hi there, and welcome to Creole Cooking with Leah Chase. Leah's popularity led her to step out of her kitchen and into a TV studio kitchen where she showed a regional audience just how she made that flavor come alive. It's better than my wood stove was when I was coming up. On the wood stove, you had to really work. But this way, you can just cook it up a little bit, see? But it was her friendship with Louisiana chef John Foles that helped introduce Leah to the rest of the world. I want to bring out the queen of Creole cooking, Leah Chase. Leah, where are you? Come on out here, sweetheart. He had her on his own TV cooking show a few times. But when the two of them hit the road together, they conquered the country with Cajun and Creole cuisine. I had an opportunity. I had a, a, an event in Philadelphia. And I called Leah and I said, Leah, they want me to come up and do Cajun and Creole, a presentation in Philadelphia. Would you come and do the Creole, the African, the Creole side, and I'll do Cajun, and let's see what happens. She said, absolutely. And I'll never forget walking onto a stage of about a 1,000 people in this massive auditorium, bigger crowd, biggest crowd I ever saw. And I walked up on the stage and I said, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Chef John Fulce, and here's my wife, Leah Chase. <laughs> and Leah looked at me, and she said, the South ain't got that forward. And the crowd went wild. And we realized we had a show. We realized we had just created the John Fulce, Leah Chase, Cajun and Creole experience. <laughs> Uh, and one time I was his mama, I said, John, don't tell people I'm your mama. Look, your daddy gonna pull out. <laughs> your daddy gonna say, what's happening? Where was the dad? <laughs> don't tell people that, you know? And sometimes I'd be his wife. I'd say, John, you're gonna get in trouble here. <laughs> Even those who couldn't get to New Orleans in person would get to know Leah Chase. Because it's more than just food, and it's more than just celebrity. It's culture, it's ongoing, and uh, it's, it's rich, enriching. So uh, we're very lucky to have that. A part of her world now resides in another section of the Smithsonian. Her red chef's jacket is on permanent display inside the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I love food, and I love to eat it, I love to serve it, and it makes people happy. For most of her life, this has been her life. She thinks better and feels better here. And so when she lost this precious space, it almost crushed her. In August of 2005, Hurricane Katrina swept through the New Orleans area, washing away lives and levees. The devastation hit every single person if not physically, certainly emotionally. And those who'd left, evacuated, had no idea what they would find and what Katrina left behind. When I got to Birmingham and began to see what was happening, it didn't soak in at first. I, I, my grandson was here, he was a fireman, and I kept telling him, I'm coming home, I'm coming to do this. He said, I'm telling you, grandmother, you cannot come. Her home, her family's homes, her beloved restaurant, all ruined. There were frogs all over the place, there was everything. It was just, you, and then you come back and there are all these flies that have gone, it was the worst thing in the world. The worst thing in the world you're gonna ever see. You don't know what to do, where to start. She remembers going to a grocery store in Baton Rouge and seeing a crown roast. She started to cry. And the lady said, well, don't worry, Miss Chase. It's coming, you're gonna soon have some. But I, I felt like an idiot just standing up there crying in the store because I had no place to cook. But I looked for Leah for weeks after Katrina miserable that I couldn't find her. 
And then finally somebody called me and said, John, she's in Baton Rouge. And I'll never forget, Dookie was on the front porch and I said, Dookie, where's Leah? And I went in and I looked at Leah and the first words out of her mouth, she said, John, I'm finished. I'm done. John, I done lost everything. And I said, Leah, you ain't lost nothing. You just got water in a building. That's all you got. And you know the rest of that story. The world came to Leah's doorstep. And when I did come back, then I was up there and I worked with John Foes. John Foes was, oh gosh, he, he was a he was magnificent. He would go around big and he'd say, you know my friend Leah, she lost everything, she doesn't have this, you need to help her. So he got people to give me money, he built that bar for me, he built, he helped me. And everybody came to this city and helped everybody. Chef John Foles, Ella Brennan, Chef John Besh, colleagues, not competitors, joined with so many others in the business world and the community to help their friend. Together, they managed to lift her spirits. Friends even saved most of the art from the encroaching mold. As it was for so many others, rebuilding took time, years even, to make a full comeback. One of the funniest stories I think that Lee and I share, the second gumbo zab day after the flood, I came to Holy Thursday with a group of friends, and I happen to have my chef jacket on. So I'm walking around her dining room, and people are clapping, and, uh, and Leah's in the kitchen, and she hears all of this noise, you know? So I'm shaking hands, and my chef coat on and Leah walks out and she sees me walking through this massive dining room full of people and she walks over to the microphone and she says, I can't believe that John Fultz is walking through my dining room shaking hands and taking credit for my gumbo zap. Everybody in the restaurant went crazy. Even after the success and popularity of the restaurant, the Chases never wanted to leave this area. For many years, a housing project stood next door. Sometimes the aging homes and buildings nearby would get run down. But they loved the people and the area. This was exactly where they wanted to be, surrounded by family, many of them working in the restaurant. Cleo is my niece. Cleo been in here for some 30-some years. I could not do without her. And my mother felt that we should never leave this community. We had the opportunity before we remodeled to maybe look at other sites in the city, but this is home to us. There is now a Dookie Chases in the airport, a taste of Creole cooking for those on their way to or from somewhere else. Actually, the chef's favorite meal isn't Creole at all. Leah Chase loves meatballs and spaghetti. She doesn't like coffee, and she really doesn't like people messing with her food. Even if they are a president of the United States, she is served too. President Barack Obama and President George W. Bush. Leah Chase is hailed as the uh, queen of Creole cuisine. While accepting an award from the prestigious James Beard Foundation, she told a story about chastising Mr. Obama for adding hot sauce to her gumbo before even tasting it. I cooked for about two presidents and they're wonderful people. Poor Mr. Obama, we had a fight the first time. <laughs> but, um, but Mr. Obama from Chicago, what you know about gumbo? Nothing. <laughs> when President George W. Bush came to Dookie's to help celebrate the reopening of the restaurant, Leah enlisted the help of her friend John Foles and his crew in the kitchen. At the end of the meal, after it was all over and done, I stuck my head out of the kitchen like this, and Leah's telling all these stories at the table. And I said, Leah Chase, you've been having me 
slave all day in that kitchen bag that promised me that I was going to meet the President of the United States. You done walked him five or six times within two feet of me and never mentioned my name one time. I said, you think I'm your slave or something? <laughs> and Leah Chase said, ain't it time? Ain't it time for you to be my slave? And the President and everybody just fell out. When Disney came to New Orleans looking for a very American story, they found one in Mrs. Chase. In The Princess and the Frog, the princess, Tiana, dreams of owning her own restaurant one day. So Leah became a model for a princess. She had a lot of fun with that. She likes the make-believe world, and she tells visitors every year during Mardi Gras. I tell them, I say, we live fair tale, but that's all right. Fair tales are good sometimes. Mardi Gras time is our make-believe time. We make believe we queens, we make believe everything, and then we come back and go to work the next day. So it's just fun to do that. Even her restaurant supplies a bit of whimsy and fantasy for her. When I first built this, I wanted that dining room to be a dining room. And then I had a parlor in there with the antique when I thought I was Scarlett O'Hara. But now I think it's time to get over that and I'll put some old tables back there where I can seat some old people. It had to be you. It had to be you. You see, I wandered around and I finally found Still singing to his love on her birthday, the two of them stood together through so much. Just and Leah realizes how much it cost him. To make me feel good as much as I could when I'm around you. He loved his music, and I always feel sorry that he could not continue his music because that he is great at music, and he was a great musician. So he sacrificed a lot of his life to make this thing work. In November of 2016, Edgar Dickey Chase Jr. passed away, leaving behind his love and his legacy. And as she has handled her grief and sorrow throughout her long life, Leah Chase keeps working. I pray a lot. You know, I'm a strong believer in prayers. I believe that whether it's fashionable or, or not fashionable, I pray every day. And I, I pray for people that I know. I pray because I'm thankful for what I have. And I pray for the strength to just go on and just do what I have to do. Coming from a place of impossibilities in the mind of the world to a place where she's looking at a pot of wiener jambalaya as her first opportunity to put a taste of Leah Chase in the mouth of New Orleans. To then be sought out globally for her talents, to be recognized by every imaginable food organization, to be just bowed to and homage to this woman. My God, how can you even express in words what accomplishment that is. It's been a long road, and all along the way, she just takes the next step, welcomes all who cross her path, and wonders what she's going to cook tomorrow. She always says that she hopes she can live long enough to pay everybody back who helped her along the way. Now I'm getting slow. And that's the worst part of getting old. You're getting slow. It's the dickens. So, and my legs are beginning to get wobbly or whatever. So it slows me down. But I like to prepare food and I like to have it done right and fixed out there nice so people can eat it and enjoy it. And I, I think I will be happy doing that for the rest of my life. And nobody else gave me a thrill. Deep in my heart, Leah, my darling, I love you still. 
It had to be you. <laughs> Wonderful well, you. Nobody but you. Ba 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 ba. Ba ba. Thank you, honey. Thank you so much. <laughs> Funding for Leah Chase, the Queen of Creole Cuisine, is made possible by the Whitney Institute, the Rhodes Family Businesses, the Dillard University Ray Charles Program in African American Material Culture, the Nellie Murray Feast Committee, Liberty Bank, McElhaney Company, Entergy Corporation, Richard and Linda Friedman, Harris New Orleans City Council Community Support Grant, Talbot Realty Group, New Orleans Auction, Susan and Fayez Serafim, Patrick F. Taylor Foundation, International House, Metro Service Group, Richard's Disposal, Friends of Leah Chase, Chef Susan Spicer, and Ed Marshall. <laughs>